Hi, and thanks for tuning in. It's Value Hunter back. And in this video series, I showcase some of the items that I collect, provide a little history on them, and the stories behind our collection, which are a key reason that so many of us collect. I hope you enjoy the discussion and see or learn something new. In this episode, I'm going to show you some unique items. And if you like the segment, be sure to subscribe and click that bell to be notified in the future on other episodes. I'd like to start with a special thank you to Winning Image Photography for creating a great intro. And you can find her channel linked below as well in the description. So sit back, enjoy, and thanks for watching. So guys, here in episode two, I'm going to show you a little bit about gold certificates and gold coins. There's quite a history in the stacking, coin collecting, and general collecting community related to gold and specifically U.S. history. It's so one of the things that's really intriguing is that gold is probably, uh, along with silver, one of the oldest monetary units or measures that exchange or currencies for exchange that have been used in history. Uh, dating back to uh, the beginning of recorded history, we have people that were considered wealthy based on gold and silver. Even in biblical times, scripture says that Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. So going back even to the first book of the Bible and recorded history, we have that wealth was measured by silver and gold. Uh, and that has carried through the, the millennia. Uh, that generational wealth has carried down many times from people collecting and holding gold and silver in, uh, and it can be used as a measure of exchange, gauged by its weight. But also over time, uh, different governments have issued a paper representation backed by gold that was held on account for those that could exchange those notes issued by a government for the monetary metal. So in this episode, I'm going to show some of my, uh, some of the things I collect a little bit of the collection and share a little bit of history about gold certificates and gold coins. In the last episode, if you guys didn't check it out, go watch that one. Uh, I'll put a link up here to that episode. I've talked about silver certificates and actual silver that you could trade those certificates in at the bank. And just like that, gold certificates were a means of exchange within day-to-day -day commerce that could be carried around very easily. They didn't weigh as much as a gold coin and they could be exchanged at the bank for gold upon demand at any time. Some of the original gold coins that you see here would have been issued by the U.S. government and the state government of the United States of America on there with a picture showing Lady Liberty with the Liberty on the Native American headdress. Now, often these were used for jewelry and you can see the mount for some sort of jewelry or button was there, but this was from 1856 and it says one dollar underneath that little gold solder there and it had a wreath around it now you can tell that this is about the size of a thumbnail and easily lost but these one dollar gold coins were used very frequently in commerce to buy one dollar worth of goods during the 1800s and really leading up and through the civil war period around that time there was also larger denominations that were issued and so you had coins in the two and a half dollar 
this one from 1879, post-Civil War, and you can see that it was still being used as jewelry. These are kind of junk gold, if you will, if you can call it that, and that's the United States of America. That's a two and a half dollar or quarter eagle, as it was known. The eagle would have been a $10 gold coin, having an eagle on the back, and then they would mint the $20 gold coins and call them double eagles. So the half eagle would have been a five, as you can see here. These, around the same time, 1882, had the similar motif, and these were $5, United States of America, half eagles. And as you notice, the $1 gold coin had the Native American headdress on, and there's always been a lot of reference in our history to Native Americans, and the imagery on our coinage is no exception. This is a $2.50 gold quarter eagle from 1911, very cool. Along that time, they also had Lady Liberty with a much more dynamic headdress. This is actually a St. Gaudens design. Roosevelt asked that St. Gaudens improve our coinage, and so he had enlisted his help before his death to design the Liberty design and also this particular headdress design, which is on this 08 $10 gold eagle with motto. Beautiful coin. One of my favorite designs, also carrying stars around the edge so one of the things that you'll see in this video guys is that the currency that was exchangeable started actually in many denominations this certifies legal tender and this is from 1922 it's a thousand dollar gold certificate or gold note payable on demand it says gold certificate on the back there would have been thousands five hundreds maybe five and ten thousands there's fifties there was twenties with the double X on the front, Roman numerals, and then the single would have been the 10. Very cool. What happened in 1928, they began to produce this smaller size note than the previous large notes. They would have a yellow or gold seal on them. They had them in multiple denominations, and it would say this is legal tender in the amount thereof in payment of all debts, public and private. This certifies that there has been deposited in the treasury of the United States of America, $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. And then the White House on the back of this note. And this one's a little bit circulated and worn, but still in pretty decent shape. They switched over in 1928 to Federal Reserve notes. And it says Federal Reserve note of the United States of America will pay to the bearer on demand $20 redeemable in gold at the U.S. State Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. And that's the series of 28. So even with the green seal, they were still placing the gold denomination on there. So these gold certificates are paper documents that represent a claim of a specific amount of gold in value, either weight or by denomination. And when the US dollar was tied to the gold standard, these gold certificates were worth their face value in gold dollars. So if I was to take this $20 gold note into a bank and exchange it, they would give me $20 worth of gold coins in exchange. Imagine that guys, being able to walk into your bank and pull out four of these quarter eagles in exchange for that piece of paper. I'm sure most of us would uh, do that with every bit of it that we could today, knowing uh, what history has taught us. The US issued gold certificates like these, identical to their face value from 1879 until 1934. And that's when they abandoned the gold standard, creating a collectible value for the gold certificates, which could no longer be exchanged for the same as the face value of gold. So it was a way to represent something that was stored. It was a store of wealth. That's an important point, guys, when you look at things that become a store of wealth. So the paper was representative of the gold, which was stored. So you have a store of wealth and the gold is a store of wealth represented by the ownership or holding of it. The banks would issue these as allocated, non-fungible, or unallocated, which is fungible. And they were a form of fractional reserve banking, not guaranteeing the equal exchange for the metal in the event of a run on the issuing bank's gold that was on deposit. So the gold certificates were actually issued from 1863 to 1933, although there are rare 1934 issues. The United States, in the form of paper currency, gave these holders the title to a corresponding amount of gold at the statutory rate of $20.67 per ounce as established by the Coinage Act 
of 1834. This type of paper currency was intended to represent actual gold. And in 1933, the practice of redeeming these notes for gold coins was ended by the US government until 1964. And until 1964, it was actually illegal to possess these notes. In 64, the restrictions were lifted primarily to allow collectors to own examples. However, issue technically converted to standard legal tender with no gold connection. After the recall of gold in 1933, which was by executive order 6102, it said that by executive order of the president issued on April 5th of 33, all persons are required to deliver on or before the 1st of May. So you have less than a month to get all your gold together and run down with that gold coin, gold bullion and gold certificates and turn it over to the Federal Reserve branch. They described further that there would be criminal penalties for violations of this executive order. Now, the executive order was enforced over time and gold was outlawed in 1933, according to this order, by President Franklin Roosevelt, taking the country effectively off the gold standard during the worst period of the Great Depression and requiring owners of gold to surrender their holdings in return for payment of $35 an ounce, taking the face value of $20 or actually $20.67 and making it $35 an ounce in exchange for people that would walk in to the bank with these. The stated reason was that hard times were causing hoarding of gold and stalling economic growth. People often fear that that may happen again. And even today, many stackers and hoarders of gold and silver believe that it's possible that the government might do something similar, which would impact the value, but also commerce. Many people did not automatically turn their gold and silver over to the US government. And so during this period of time after 1933, when the order was passed and May 1st, when it was demanded that people turn this over, there was many changes that had to take place. First of all, the executive order was found by federal judge John Woolsey that on the grounds of the fact that it was signed by the president instead of the secretary of treasury as required made it not enforceable. And so what happened was they passed an additional executive order, which was 6260 and 61 re related to the seizure of gold and had that signed by Henry Morgenthau Jr., who you may recognize is the signature at the bottom of many of the currency issues of the day. A few months later, Gold Reserve Act of 1934 was passed, which ratified Roosevelt's order. It made treasury regulations providing civil penalties and confiscation of gold and fines equal to double the value of the gold seized. Many prosecutions of U.S. citizens and non-citizens followed these orders, and there's a few of these that are really well-known cases. Gus Farber may be the most, which had exchanged and was selling gold coins. He was a jeweler from San Francisco, and there was an actual sting operation where the Secret Service came in and found that he, members of his family and others, had been doing exchange of gold coins secretly behind the scenes during these periods. Who knows? Maybe this is back in circulation from one of those such events. The executive order that Roosevelt passed was effectively made under the authority of Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 and the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. And an interesting point is that when they increased from $20.67 to $35 an ounce, it basically increased the gold on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet by 69%. That's a cool way of doing some accounting. The increase in the assets allowed them to further inflate the money supply and a devaluation of the US dollar. They held that $35 per ounce price total until 1971. And on August 15th, Richard Nixon announced that the United States would no longer convert dollars to gold at a fixed value and abandoned that status. In 64, President Gerald Ford signed into legislation that Americans officially, again, could own gold bullion. So quite a torrid history and past related to gold and our country, our monetary system, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and all elements of the coinage in the United States and the fiat currency in the United States, as well as gold-backed currency in the United States. Pretty cool to hold these pieces of history in your hands, guys. And not only are they fun to look at, but each one of these things tells its own story. So guys, in summary, 
I will just say that owning gold is a great way to store wealth. It's an asset that has been known since the beginning of time to be a monetary metal, always recognizable in almost every single culture in history as a means for commerce and trade. And if you're a collector like me, you may enjoy having a piece of history by a non-exchangeable for gold, <laughs> gold certificate. I really appreciate all of you guys checking this out. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Collecting History. And until next time, this has been your host, Val Hunter, and I'm signing out. <laughs>